Hi, I'm Dr. Paul Leahy, one of the plastic surgeons here at Monarch Plastic Surgery. It's just a, another one of the videos in the series that we're trying to create to help give patients some education, uh, a little preview of what the consultation process might be like when they come to see us, and hopefully something that you can share with friends or family members if they have questions or you want to refer to it after we've met because there's certainly lots of questions. Uh, so this particular video is going to focus on breast augmentation surgery. Um, as you might imagine, the, the uh, benefits of that are pretty clear, obviously having a little bit more volume to the breast, uh, creating a, a more, more natural or more enhanced um, look and shape and feel of the breast um, can help give patients a lot of uh, improved confidence, it makes your clothes fit better, um, and a variety of benefits there. So uh, in trying to establish whether or not you're a good candidate for that, um, Obviously, we spend quite a bit of time during the consultation process to um, help evaluate that. But you want to basically make sure you're in otherwise good health, taking very few medications. Um, uh, if you do have any medical problems, making sure that those are under good control. Um, uh, we prefer patients not be smoking or using any nicotine products, uh, be in good health, um, a good weight. Um, and have a good exercise and diet routine in place. Uh, just be, being as healthy as you possibly can be prior to any surgery. And um, if you um, have been pregnant already or planning a pregnancy, that will factor into the decisions that we make and will help to sort that out during your consultation as well. So um, basically there are a few things that we need to try to help uh, present to you, uh, decisions that need to be made about how the process goes. And um, the first of those tends to be um, choosing the incision location. So uh, the most tried and true way of doing that, at least in my hands, tends to be utilizing an incision just underneath the breast and the crease right here. We call that the inframammary fold or the inframammary crease. Uh, if you look at well done studies worldwide, that tends to be the most common incision choice um, for surgeons and patients alike. But there are other options. Um, we can certainly utilize an incision around the areola, kind of the pigmented skin just outside of the nipple. Uh, some surgeons prefer to go up in the, in the armpit area or the axilla. And there are even some folks that will um, choose to put that in through the belly button or the umbilicus. Uh, that's obviously a much more involved procedure and, and not something that I do. Uh, but, but basically, um, I would say at least 95% of the time, if not better, uh, we're using an incision right underneath the breast here. It hides really well, it's predictable, uh, it gives the surgeon access to really the quote business end of things, uh, trying to create beauty in the lower half of the breast, we call it the lower pole of the breast, and it's the most direct route in which to put the implant, um, at, least, at least for me. Um, the, uh, whenever you make an incision on the breast, um, that leaves a scar, of course, but we try to do that in a way that minimizes the appearance of that scar and one that should hide well, uh, both in and out of clothing. So the next choice then after incision um, location would be whether or not the implant that you choose is going to be above or below your chest muscle. So we're talking about uh, the pectoralis major muscle. So uh, some surgeons prefer to uh, put the implant underneath the muscle and basically resting on top of your rib cage. Other surgeons will go on top of that muscle and sometimes there's some varieties uh, beyond that as well. But uh, again, uh, if you look at worldwide numbers, the most common way is to go underneath the muscle. Um, surgeons debate this all the time, although at least the way that I read the literature, at least there's some suggestion that the body kind of leaves the implant alone a little bit more, in other words, a little bit less risk of um, symptomatic scars forming around the implant themselves when they're underneath the muscle. Uh, and also, um, I like it because um, having the implant under the muscle, the muscle will be constantly pushing down on that implant, tends to give it a little bit more natural takeoff of the upper portions of the breast, make it look more natural. Um, uh, other surgeons also believe that because if the implant is under your muscle and you're constantly moving, that's all, always sort of massaging the implant and that can help keep the scarring around the implant um, to at least a, a minimal degree if, if we can. Um, so I, I like to go underneath the muscle. The, um, the, the next choice then will be 
what type of implant would be the best for you. So um, we really still have two main categories of breast implants. One is going to be the saline or the salt water filled implants, the other being the silicone gel filled implants. So there's pros and cons to each of these. Um, the uh, since sort of the fall of November uh, 2006, the silicone gel implants have been back on the market in the U.S. Um, keeping in mind they were uh, always available worldwide, but the U.S. had a hold on the implants for a time from sort of the early 90s to 2006 while they were evaluated. Um, but they were, they were put back on the market for cosmetic use um, in 2006 in the fall. And really since then, they've really um, started to take back over the market in terms of choosing silicone versus saline and I think a lot of us believe that it really creates it's a better implant it seems to create a more natural appearance to the breast it moves a little bit more like lifelike tissue than the saline implants um, but there are scenarios in which that the, the saline implants um, can work very well in fact may be preferable and we'll try to sort that out for you um, no implant is a lifetime implant so by committing to this one surgery you're you're definitely going to plan on another one at some point in your lifetime um, for a variety of reasons. And so that's something uh, to know about as well. We like to see our breast augmentation patients um, at least yearly once you've healed and been through the initial process to make sure that that device is well and healthy and doing what it needs to do. The implant manufacturers have a variety of warranties available. Uh, the websites for those manufacturers will, will be providing for you and it details all of that. Uh, but they're actually very, very good warranties um, to help you. Um, so once we've kind of covered those issues for you during the consultation process, the next component will be making sure that we answer all of your questions, um, and then we'll move to the examination process. And so during that um, step, we'll want to make sure that we point out um, any asymmetries that you might have in your breast, which is actually very common. Almost every single patient has at least a little bit of left and right difference. The breast augmentation process can sometimes make that more pronounced, and so we need to make sure we, we cover that. Um, but by and large, we can do things during the surgery to hopefully help correct for that. Um, the, um, we'll take some measurements, and then um, after that, we'll give you the opportunity to try on the variety of implants that we have. So we have sort of a non-padded sports bra that we can use. You can try on the implants that seem to match your figure and also what your wishes and your goals are. Um, based on the dimensions and, and the measurements that we take. And I, I have found that seems to be the most lifelike way of um, getting out what the final result might look like. So it's helpful for patients to bring in different um, clothing tops that they like to wear, something you might work out in, something you might uh, wear out, um, you know, and even just kind of, you know, more casual type clothing as well. And uh, you'll have at least, at least in my practice, you'll have at least two opportunities to do that. One at the initial consultation, and then again, uh, before we go to the operating room, we would bring you back for what we call a preoperative teaching appointment, which will address any last minute questions, um, the consent forms are available, and you'll confirm that that's the implant that you like. And um, I found that that's the best way to really um, get you what you want and, and get the result that you're after. Uh, we take before pictures at that time, and then we'll take some afterwards as well after, during you know, different phases of the healing process. Um, you will leave our consultation process with a detailed um, cost um, estimate so you know exactly what you're up against in terms of the financing. So um, then um, we would um, show up for surgery, and uh, we would get you prepped. Uh, we would make some markings. You'll get an antibiotic um, in your IV and you'll have uh, devices to help massage your calves during the procedure to hopefully minimize the risks of blood clots. The surgery itself takes just barely over an hour, um, and then you recover in the recovery area for another hour, hour and a half, and then you get to go home. And then typically we want to see you back in the office the next day. Uh, we try to use um, uh, stitching or suture material that absorbs on its own. Uh, we have some waterproof dressings, and I typically will let my patients shower within 24, 48 hours after surgery. And then you sort of live in a sports bra day and night for at least the first few uh, week or so. Um, Activity-wise, we want you up walking, um, taking deep breaths, you know, trying to get back to life as soon as possible is the best way to prevent uh, problems. Um, and you'll have some medications from us. So there's usually a, a narcotic pain medication. Um, I use a drug called Valium, which is a muscle relaxer. 
uh, and something for nausea. But at least in my hands, what I really like patients to get over as soon as possible to something more like Advil, Aleve, Motrin, Ibuprofen, uh, plain Tylenol, those sorts of things, um, and minimize using some of the more prescription medications. Uh, sometimes awkward to talk about, but it's a good idea to take a stool softener because the medications that you're given during surgery will make you um, have constipation. And, um, and then again, just the, the generally we try to get you back to activity slowly as soon as, uh, as you're ready to do that. We generally see you back about week one and then uh, about three or four weeks after that, and then typically about uh, week six, three months, six months, a year, and then yearly after that. And uh, again, these implants should last you a long, long time, and um, if there's any problems along the way, we certainly want to know about that. So um, hopefully that's um, helped give you some basic understanding about the breast augmentation process. The uh, American Society of Plastic Surgeons or the ASPS consent form is available, and it's, it's definitely something you ought to look at and take seriously. Um, the complications of breast augmentation are things that we would cover in the consultation process as well. Uh, but the biggest issues that we tend to see with it in terms of risks are going to be um, scarring. There are sensory changes that happen to the breast skin, including the nipple, uh, that can be permanent. Um, uh, we call it contour irregularity, in other words, rippling or wrinkling uh, due to the implant that you can is sometimes visible. Uh, capsular contracture, that means that where um, the body will make um, a, a scar around the implant, everyone has that. The, the trick and the goal is to make that be as soft and as pliable as possible. But in some situations, for reasons that aren't totally understood, that scar can become more thick. It can actually compress the implant and make it look um, not as natural. And in the worst case, it can be uncomfortable. And that can require more surgery. Um, there's definitely going to be at least some degree of asymmetry. In other words, left and right um, uh, breasts will be at least a little bit of difference if you sit and stare in the mirror. Now, by and large, we our goal is perfection. It's just that Mother Nature takes over and forces beyond your control, my control, that can affect that balance. Um, and another issue such as pain and um, you know, getting back to life and, and activities and that sort of thing, restrictions in terms of working out, all these are things that, that we would cover as well. Um, you still need to have mammograms and so we'll be counseling you about that. That should be um, yearly at least after age 40, at least that's the, the, the current recommendations we have in front of us today. Um, when you go to have a mammogram, you'll tell the te technologist you have implants, and then they help to use different views to visualize that. Um, there's really good evidence to uh, suggest that having a breast implant does not in any way um, decrease your ability to detect breast cancer or um, how people do if they do or if they are diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, and some, some surgeons even believe that with that implant in place, pressing out against the breast tissue, you may potentially be more likely to feel an abnormality and hopefully detect that and um, you know, show that to one of your doctors, and certainly that can be us as well. Um, but those are really the biggest issues that we see um, you know, once people are recovered. So again, I hope that that's uh, shed some light on the process, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in our office, and please reach out if you have other questions. Thanks.